Okay, I actually have to stop the share and then restart it. Can you see Dr. Herrera's smiling face? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, uh, it is a really great pleasure to introduce this year's Jeanette Bernard Post Memorial Lecture um, of doc, uh, Dr. Joseph Herrera. Uh, but before we get into a little bit about Dr. Herrera, I wanted to thank the committee um, Isabel sent an email early on in this process with this recommendation, um, and it, it could not be more appropriate, given the fact that uh, Dr. Post's father uh, was a rehab doctor. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that Cal is at a meeting today. I don't know if he's joining us remotely. He knows this, the scheduling uh, was unavoidable, um, so he's not here today but he wanted us to go ahead um, with this lecture. So I wanted to thank the committee. There are several visiting professor committees and the post committee is made up here. And I like what uh, you guys have done and that you continue to include me, I appreciate, but that's really, uh, really nice of you to do this and to handle this and to organize it. Um, so Cal, uh, who, as you know, is the professor and chair emeritus, uh, established this lecture uh, initially in memoriam to his father and then adding his mother later. Um, they're both very unusual people, both way ahead of their time. Uh, his mother was one of the first litigators on Long Island and in New York, uh, and his father uh, was as I understand it, because never met him, a uh, very innovative uh, rehabilitation oriented physician. Um, and Cal established this along with several other beautiful things in this department uh, for which we are forever grateful. This is the 20th year. Um, so Cal's vision started 20, 22 years ago and then established it 20 years ago. And if you look at who has come, you are in really great company, Joe. Uh, Chris Ragnarsson, who was the chair, uh, was the first post lecture. Isn't that interesting? And here we are 20 years later uh, with you as the lecturer. And you can see a group of really some of the most illustrious people in our field, uh, not least of which our members of our own department uh, with Jay Mako and Tom Oxley, um, Eric Nessler, Chandra Sen. Um, so uh, it really is, you're really in uh, some pretty important company here. And to the group, uh, Dr. Herrera, I consider a personal friend. Um, and um, although we don't spend a lot of time socializing, uh, I think that we both uh, feel very positively about each other as friends and colleagues. Um, he is now the Lucy Moses Professor and System Chair of the Department of Rehab and Human Performance, which is the somewhat recent name of the department. Um, he has become very interested in human performance. Um, he's interested in concussion and sports related injuries. Uh, he has recruited stellar people to promote this vision of an expanded view of rehabilitation. Um, and he's also a hands-on doctor uh, who performs procedures every week. Um, he has many national roles, one of which that you see here is that he's the editor of the Medi of current reviews in musculoskeletal medicine. Um, so Joe, it's a real pleasure to have you with us and we look forward to your lecture and to continuing our collaboration with you and your department. And I'll stop my share with that. Well, thank you for that. Let me just share my screen. 
Okay, so first, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pedersen, for inviting me to speak here today to the committee. Um, it is de uh, definitely an honor to be a post lecturer, um, and it was interesting to see that uh, Dr. Ragnarsson was the first post lecturer, uh, so this is truly an honor. And congratulations to the neurosurgery team for being ranked um, uh, so highly in Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report and having such accolades in, in Blue Ridge. Now, when I became chair in 2016, uh, one of my missions was to bring innovation to the department. Um, interestingly enough, the past year and a half has seen a rapid adoption of innovation that we don't usually see in medicine. Everything from telehealth to uh, even rapid adoption of new vaccines that a lot of people are resistant to taking, but still, you know, a lot of rapid adoption. So today I want to discuss uh, some of the updates we've made to our concussion program and how we've incorporated innovation uh, in this whole process. Now, um, I don't have any financial disclosures here. I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, but as Dr. Benson mentioned, I am the official medical provider for Red Bull uh, North America and for USA Fencing. And as a plug for our department, um, when I became chair, I rebranded our department from Rehabilitation Medicine to the Department of Rehabilitation and Human Performance. I always believed as a, or as a rehabilitation doctor that we were always in the business of improving and maximizing human performance whether it's after spinal cord injury, brain injury, um, musculoskeletal injuries. And now we've delved into those who are healthy, meaning that we maximize both cognitive and physical health uh, for our athletes, executives, and our average everyday Joe. Uh, thus our relationships with the Brooklyn Nets, New York Liberty, and, New Jersey, and the New Jersey Devils. Um, so I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Petrino and Kristen Dams O'Connor for providing and sharing some of their slides with, uh, for me today uh, for this presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> before I started my career in medicine, I was an athlete. I competed in it both in high school and college. I was an NCAA athlete. I was also a coach uh, before I entered medicine. I always pictured my career as one uh, that, that dealt with biomechanics due to my understanding uh, of mechanics through throwing, jumping, running, rowing. There was one night though, when my focus turned from physical to cognitive. It was on March 12, 2002 in Cipriani's, um, yes, it was a restaurant where there was an ESPN event. And this was my first day on the New York State Athletic Commission. And so let's roll the tape. Oh man, chopping shot. And I think this one's going to get stopped by Steve Smoker. Yes. Stancil is out cold. Oh, oh, oh. On the canvas. Little movement. Johnson picked his spot for the right hand. A right hand that Stancil did not see. The more experienced Johnson took Stancil into the deep waters, as we were talking about. And was <laughs> To really catch him. A nice clean shot late. Now those New York doctors were in that ring. 224 KO. The fight was even officially stopped. Golden Johnson. Yes, Close fight. So that was Chantal Stancil against Golden Johnson. It was the 11th round. And that night, my interest in concussion was born trying to understand and how to prevent CTE, um, how, to how to prevent all the neurodegenerative processes that came along with, uh, with head injury. Also, how do we manage concussion? You know, so how do we care for those such as football players, lacrosse, soccer, boxers, uh, uh, from preventing further concussion and further new, uh, neurodegenerative processes? So I became very much involved in trying to create our concussion program here at Sinai, along with our sports program. So today we'll evaluate our, our past concussion program, look at lessons learned, 
discuss some of the programmatic barriers and challenges, evaluate how we've now incorporated technology uh, in concussion management and discuss next steps. So uh, to create a um, uh, uh, common understanding, you know, concussion has, uh, and its definition has gone through a number of different uh, definitions, although minute changes here and there. Um, this is the latest um, uh, definition for sports-related concussion from the International Conference of Concussion Sports that was held in Berlin in 2016. Basically, what it says is that sports-related concussion is defined as the immediate and transient symptoms following a mild traumatic brain injury occasioned during sports. Sports-related concussions is, is caused by direct force delivered to the head or anywhere else in the body, which results in an impulsive force being transmitted to the brain. In some cases, signs and symptoms evolve over a number of uh, uh, minutes to hours, and in most cases, resolve spontaneously by seven to 10 days. Providing the individual is not exposed to any further impacts, concussion is a common injury in contact sports with an incidence rate of approximately one per 1,000 athletic exposures in the NFL and up to four concussions per 1,000 player match hours in elite rugby union. So this became my focus. Now, these are CDC statistics. About 170 million adults participate in uh, physical and recreational activities. 38 million children and adolescents participate in organized sports and approximately 1.6 to 3.8 million sports and recreational related concussions occur per year. So in 2013, um, uh, I partnered with Wayne Gordon um, and Joshua Cantor uh, to start uh, our, our concussion program through the department. Uh, this was in response to the Zachary Lysted law, uh, which was passed in 2019 in Washington state, which stated that athletes suspected of a concussion must be taken out of play and only a licensed healthcare provider trained in concussion management can clear the, uh, the athlete back to play. This law, uh, this became law in New York state through the Concussion Management and Awareness Act in 2012, thus our 2013 uh, launch of the program. You may recognize some of these people that are on this slide. Uh, so this was our play safe program that we developed. We collaborated, we collaborated with emergency medicine, neuro neurology, neuropsychology, neurosurgery, you can see uh, Dr. Chowdhury there, orthopedic surgery, pediatrics, and our, our own doctors here in the department. Some of these doctors have retired or moved on to other careers, but this was the beginning. Now, <coughs> excuse me. When our athletes came to us, hopefully, uh, we, they were some of our athletes that we did our pre-participation exams on, uh, baselined them, whether they were high school or, or co uh, college athletes. Most often, they came straight to, the, to our office uh, uh, from the emergency room, or we saw them on the sideline. So that's when we started to see some of these post-injury evaluations. Um, and then they would go on to our recovery protocol, uh, which I'll, I'll highlight, reevaluate, and hopefully return, return them to play. Now, this is the uh, SCAT. This is the most uh, 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 widely used, most commonly used concussion assessment tool in uh, sports, con uh, in sports uh, which incorporates cognitive assessment, symptom reporting, physical examination, coordination, and balance testing. This is what we use to screen and what we use on the sideline, and in, even in the office as well. And uh, most of you are familiar with this. This is uh, the, uh, the common uh, return uh, graded ex uh, exertion protocol. That's a return to play protocol, uh, commonly used in the NFL. Um, and as you can see here, initially, when we first started the program, uh, the it, step one, the initial recommendation was complete and total rest. Now that is no longer the case actually complete and total rest, both physically and cognitively, may be detrimental to those who have been concussed. So we now recommend physical and cognitive activity as tolerated. And so what does that mean? And we'll, we'll get to uh, how we help our athletes with that. Now, while most of our athletes um, manage to get through in about seven to 10 days, okay, it's our athletes that get stuck in this recovery phase here. They get reevaluated, have con continuing post-concussive symptoms, and uh, continue to go on 
Um, interestingly enough, some of our uh, athletes uh, that we took care of would sometimes miss semesters, you know, so they sometimes missed a whole year of schooling just because of their post-concussive symptoms. This became an issue. This is an interesting article, um, which stated that non-hospitalized patients with mild TBI have been recently described as the forgotten minority. And at six months after injury, 36% showed in, uh, incomplete recovery as measured by the Glasgow outcome scale extended. Only roughly 25% of non-hospitalized patients with mild TBI that originally presented to the uh, emergency, emergency department for their injuries seek an outpatient consult with a neurologist within six months of their injury. So this is a problem, especially those who have post-concussive symptoms. There's a delay in diagnosis. There's a delay in looking for treatment. So how do we fix this? So with the current program that we had that started in 2013, you know, I started to uh, reevaluate what our program meant, where the barriers and challenges were, and how could we make this program a lot better? So first off, there was an access issue. Uh, some of the uh, patients that were um, sent to us would not be scheduled until about a week to two weeks later, which was way too long. You know, by that time, their symptoms had, um, had resolved. The second issue uh, was data. You know, we were doing all of this uh, screening, uh, especially with the SCAT, but there was, the data was scattered. They were, it was all over the place. And I don't think we were collecting enough data. The biggest barrier and challenge to, to treating those that were concussed is that there was a lack of objective measures. And this actually is where I started to really focus in. Uh, when, I, when I joined Sinai in 2005 and um, partnered with Wayne Gordon at the time, we, I started asking, what, what do we need to look for to say objectively that somebody was concussed? What we usually uh, rely on symptomatic reports, symptom reporting, um, or impact, which again is very subjective, um, but there was no true objective measure. In fact, um, we, I got a study through the IRB that tried to look at CSF and blood products from our professional boxers uh, immediately after, uh, after they were done boxing. Mind you, none of them <laughs> signed up for that, for the spinal tap, okay? And um, a lot of the agents were like, yeah, nope, uh, my boxer is not going to be a, uh, 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 an experiment. So we, we had zero enrollees into that program. Uh, although my, my, my passion for finding that objective measure still uh, stands today, and I have some exciting things to share here. Also resources, you know, some of our concussed patients came to us and started sharing some of the things that they wanted to know about, you know, um, nutraceuticals, um, uh, hyperbaric chambers, uh, et cetera. So, um, so what did we do? So when I started looking at PlaySafe 2.0, I decided to combine that clinical program that we developed look at what our athletes are doing, our P360 model. So uh, Performance 360 is a program we developed um, uh, back in 2017 uh, that took all of the expertise in the sports world, um, everything from uh, mental strengthening coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, to um, uh, looking at technologies that helped improve uh, performance, both cognitively and physically. Uh, and marrying that with our Abilities Research Center, which is our center that is our house for innovation. Um, it's an accelerator and incubator for uh, newer technologies that help those uh, uh, in rehabilitation. So combining all these three things then uh, caused us to focus in and look at a few different domains. So what are the key domains that we needed to look, that we need to look at in order to make our concussion program a lot better. So you can see here around the, uh, the different domains, we have cognitive, vestibular, uh, cervical MSK, neuropsych, sleep health, audiology, and uh, the autonomic, okay? The next slide is a little bit busy. And then we further broke it down into protocols. And you can see how each of these different buckets have different spaces in baseline protocol, post-injury protocol, and recovery protocol, all right? So mind you, we did not eliminate the, the medical piece of this. This is in addition to that, all right? Which now makes our concussion program a lot more robust.
Okay, so we'll break this down uh, individually. Um, so as far as our new model is concerned, um, we had the uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, field test this. Um, we recently had a very generous donation for uh, to create the Charles Lazarus Children's Ability Center. Charles Lazarus was a founder of Toys R Us, and um, through through that, uh, we are now using technology to, to help children. And we are now partnered with Fieldston. Um, we have a concussion partnership with them and started screening all of their students. Um, and we were able to pilot our baseline protocol. So our baseline protocol um, involved uh, first the cognitive part using SCAT, brain check, and the BISC. Uh, I'll describe each of those as we move forward. Looking at the autonomic, meaning resting heart, uh, heart rate variability through a uh, app called Happy Tech. Uh, looking at cervical range of motion through vi uh, video computer vision. Uh, looking at sleep health through the Pittsburgh Sleep Scale, uh, Athletes Help uh, helps Sleep Screening Questionnaire, and the vestibular portion, which is the postural, postural sway app. Okay. So, Here's the SCAT, uh, we, we, uh, that's again standard. Uh, we did that for everybody. Now, this is our fellow, Chris Hoglid. He is using an iPad, okay, uh, uh, to uh, quantify cervical range of motion. Um, so there's an app that we're using uh, that is using vi uh, video computer vision uh, to do the kinematic measurements immediately, okay? We then use this product called Happy Tech. Uh, Happy Tech is a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, measures uh, heart rate variability uh, by using the light on the back of an iPhone. Okay, it's validated. It's been uh, shown to uh, uh, help uh, those um, um, who are interested in heart rate variability, such as our athletes. And more importantly, um, what we were seeing for our concussed patients, you know, from 2013 till now, was uh, this um, exercise intolerance, and they would complain that their heart would race. And and what we do know, and it's very well documented, that concussion can cause an overreact, uh, overactivation of the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. So we are now baselining our athletes uh, for heart rate variability using Happy Tech. Now, this is a homegrown app. Um, it's called the Sway app. Um, more uh, expensive platforms to, to check Sway um, in, include uh, 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 platforms, uh, force platforms, force plate pl uh, platforms. But this one uses an iPhone, okay, uh, de de developed in our Abilities Research Center. Uh, our athletes uh, usually uh, do a few different poses. Uh, first, double legged stance with eyes open and closed. Uh, single legged stand right, right and left, eyes open and closed. Tandem uh, stance, uh, left leg in front. Uh, tandem stance again, right leg in front, eyes open and closed. And again, uh, we use this app just to get the baseline. And after concussion, we will do that again after the concussed uh, the, uh, patient return. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, this whole process of, ga of gathering all of this data took a total of 11 minutes per athlete, okay? We've now uh, road tested this and have uh, tested this on more than 350 kids over the last uh, four weeks now, you know? So between Fieldson and other schools that we're working with, we've uh, gathered data on 350 children um, using this. So it's effective, it's quick, and it's scalable, you know? So using technologies to use this as a baseline um, is, is doable. Now, a little bit about impact and um, uh, going back to the cognitive base here. Um, so impact um, is the uh, most widely used computer-based uh, testing uh, module uh, to baseline uh, our NCAA athletes and also the professional teams. It has six modules where discrimination, design, memory, X is an O, symbol matching, color matching, and three letters. Now, the issue, though, is um, this is a study that was done here at, at Sinai. Um, impact has holes. OK, so this was a, a study that looked at uh, some local uh, athletes here, uh, NCAA Division I, Division I athletes that were screened. 
And what we found with impact was that there was un, that was that there was an underreporting of concussions. Okay, so on impact, they asked, "Have you ever been concussed, and what what is that number?" And you can see here on the left hand side, this this has already been published, um, that seventy three athletes, okay, reported zero concussions. Now the BISC, which was developed here, the Brain Injury Screening Questionnaire which has been validated, okay, shows that there, was, uh, that there was a discrepancy between impact and the uh, number of reporting. So on the BISC, we asked the number of blows to the head, okay? And you can see here, it ranged from two to three. So, and interestingly enough, one of the athletes, so, uh, who was a volleyball player, again, she was an NCAA uh, uh, division one athlete, um, was one of these athletes that was in the, uh, seven, in the group of 73. Um, she had severe post-concussive symptoms and actually was uh, reported after we discussed it with her that she fell off a horse um, uh, twice um, and had a history of, um, uh, of two big blows to the head, but reported zero concussions. She actually was the one that missed two semesters of college uh, just because of her, her, her symptoms. So is impact good enough? I mean, it's, it's, it's what's there and what's most widely used, but we've now added the BISC to our um, uh, screening process as well. Oh, okay. So this, um, this I'm really excited about. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is NeuroCheck. This is a portable system capable of measuring steady state visually evoked potentials that was developed to provide an objective quantifiable method of EEG testing following a traumatic event. So what this is, you'll see here in the front, is um, this is like a VR screen, okay, uh, that uh, delivers a 15 hertz flicker stimulus while this wireless uh, EEG uh, headset reported occipital activity. Now, so the, uh, we, um, this, uh, this was used on 60, 65 healthy uh, rugby players, Okay, um, and the players were instructed to stare at the screen fixation point while remaining seated and quiet. Uh, mind you, you, they could keep their eyes open and closed. Uh, and what we were looking for was a signal. Okay, and uh, this was recently published in 2020. Uh, so this signal was found consistently. So there were a few different points when we when the athletes were tested preseason. 72 hours after each uh, match, okay, in order to validate this signal, all right? We'll come back to this a little bit later. So uh, looking for this signal um, in normal individuals was important. Okay, let's um, now move to our post-injury protocol. So now we have our athlete. They now get concussed. What do we do? So we want to evaluate them within 48 hours, all right? We implement, we, we implement brain checks, the SCAT-5 again, uh, neuropsych evaluation, I'll get to that in a second. Um, brain gauge, okay? Again, check our heart rate variability. Um, use the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Protocol, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and then look at our uh, cervical range of motion. Uh, some of these patients can have continued headaches. Some of them are cer cervicogenic headaches. And then go through our sleep health and vestibular uh, protocol, which now we add fr uh, frenzel goggles. Okay. So again, I'm super excited about um, NeuroCheck because here, okay, so out of those 65 athletes, uh, there were 12 um, athletes that became concussed, All right? So this was the baseline, All right? And what you see within 72 hours of evaluation, that, that uh, 15 hertz peak is gone, okay? It, it's, it's gone. We didn't ask them about their symptoms. It, was, it just disappeared. All right. We then uh, retested them after uh, the clinician said that they were clear to return to play. And when they were retested, that 15 hertz signal was present again. Okay, mind you, this is a pilot study. All right. Um, so this really excites me. 
It's an easy um, set of goggles that you can see here, all right, that you can use on the sideline, all right, to test and hopefully find an objective um, uh, finding uh, as far as concussion is concerned. So this I'm really excited about. I know that there are other uh, others out there, such as the eye tracking uh, module. I mean, the eye tracking goggles. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the Frenzel goggles. But this really excites me. Again, mind you, it, this is only one piece of the uh, puzzle as far as concussion is concerned. But again, very exciting. I think that uh, there's something here. And we're we um, just recently got funded uh, for some additional uh, dollars to continue to investigate this. Okay, so uh, Frenzel goggles, <coughs> we have the Interacoustic inter Visual Eyes 505 video Frenzel. Um, what we're uh, doing here is um, once a patient is concussed, we look for any uh, nystagmus or saccades or um, anything that's out of the ordinary. Um, ideally, we would like to do this baseline, but it's, it, I think it's a little bit overkill. So we're using it more for um, uh, uh, post-injury management. Um, now, the interesting thing here too is that we've also developed a, pr a program that, that it does utilize some eye tracking uh, because eye tracking is correlated with concussion symptoms and there's detected convergence and accommodative abnormalities associated with concussion. So um, uh, we believe that this is another objective measure. Okay. Um, I know that um, uh, Jam Jagar and uh, the a lot of the uh, uh, devices he's created, we actually have one of his devices here in the department. Um, and June Maruda uh, is uh, continuing to investigate eye tracking. Uh, but just taking the Ambien, and um, this is from our, our professional athletes, uh, have been able to trick that eye tracking. Uh, you know, so they would take that for a uh, baseline. So it's a little bit flawed. So I think for every time we try to uh, detect something, there's a way to get around it in order to get back on the field. All right, we are also utilizing BrainCheck and BrainGage. Uh, BrainCheck is a uh, screening tool uh, for anybody who has any cognitive concerns. Uh, it's used to uh, for people who have any memory complaints. It provides us with a quick and accurate uh, way to assess cognitive function. It has standardized and custom customizable cognitive assessment batteries, and um, it can be done remotely. So interestingly enough, brain check we've been using not only for our patients who've had uh, who've been concussed, but a number of our uh, COVID long haulers um, who uh, still complain of brain fog. Um, and we've been using brain check because they can do it at home. Like you can do it on an iPad or a laptop. And we've been uh, fortunate enough to, to see how our um, uh, post-COVID patients have been uh, improving uh, by using BrainCheck. BrainGage, uh, similar to BrainCheck, is also a oops, sorry, uh, computerized uh, model uh, here uh, that uses touch-based sensory testing uh, to measure your brain health. It's a uh, quick and uh, most accurate way to track movement, uh, improvement in mental fitness. So uh, it uses eight essential components of brain health, speed, focus, fatigue, accuracy, and uh, sequencing, and timing perception. So uh, we, we love these uh, computer-based um, models. Next, the other addition um, to our concussion program is now we have some of our therapists and physicians implementing the Buffalo treadmill protocol, okay? So the Buffalo concussion treadmill test is a validated test to measure the amount of aerobic exercise that is safe to, safe to perform, even in the acute phase for concussion. So the heart rate achieved at symptom exacerbation is called the heart rate threshold. So we usually tell our patients to exercise under that heart rate threshold. Usually it's about 70% of that heart rate threshold. So, um, and we use this in our next phase, which is our recovery protocol. All right, so our recovery protocol, uh, you can see here, again, our different buckets. Um, we use Neuron Up, again, a new innovative way of, uh, of um, doing some neuro rehabil neuro rehabilitation, neuropsychology. Um, we then use uh, the Buffalo treadmill protocol for our return uh, to activity. Um, 
and manual therapy for any cervical issues. As far as sleep, uh, we've also involved some technology here, sauna health, I'll, I'll touch base on that. And uh, vestibular and nutrition, I'll touch base on those as well. Okay, so the Buffalo uh, treadmill protocol actually helps us get through these uh, six phases of exercise um, ex uh, through the exercise exertion protocol. <clears throat> Mind you, uh, the Buffalo treadmill protocol is used uh, primarily in stage one and two uh, for our athletes who have uh, post concussive syn uh, syndrome. Um, and then we then progress them uh, through three through six once they get past that. Uh, but overall, it's been useful, uh, whether they have a, a smartwatch or a Fitbit where they can uh, measure their heart rate. Um, it's been useful in helping us help them get back to activity and get back to play. All right, a little plug for our Brain Injury Research Center. Um, this is what our clinical and research program is, is integrated. Um, it's for those who seek clinical services, uh, uh, and it also offers an opportunity for those to, par uh, to participate in research that continues to improve the care uh, for those that have brain injury. Uh, so our department, I'm proud to say, is um, on, on the one of only nine hospitals to be at both a brain injury and spinal cord injury model system. We're the only one in New York State. Um, currently, our Blue Ridge ranking for NIH dollars, uh, Kristen Dams O'Connor is ranked number sixth in the country. Our department is ranked number 11 in the country. So we're really proud of that. So we use a lot of evidence-based uh, processes, processes here for neuropsychology. So if any of your patients need that, please let us know. So um, research indicates that TBI education that includes clear and empirically based information to set recovery expectations is associated with, with shortened recovery and better outcomes. Now more than ever, since TBI is increasingly viewed as a risk factor for neurodegenerative diseases, there is an understandable iatrogenesis for, that can perpetuate cycles of symptoms. So our TBI education uh, includes are promoting a recovery-based mentality, uh, provide education about concussion, set a positive expectation of recovery, and prevent iatrogenic effects. Uh, we have this whole educational uh, program that looks at concussion 101, uh, what to expect after sustaining concussion, coping with symptoms, exercise and activity pacing, and, pro and progression, vocational recovery, and return to work. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, as far as the neuropsych evalu uh, evaluation, uh, usually it's a, uh, the common referrals come about as uh, cognitive, whether they have attention issues, memory, if executive functioning, uh, emotional and behavioral concerns, uh, return to work, school and activity. Did he just, did we just lose his connection? Let me text Joe. I see him still on here, um, but muted with screen off. Muted and screen is frozen though, right? Yep. I think the connection is gone. Yeah. I'm going to text him. And I'm going to call him as well. So sorry about that. It just lost the uh, power here. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Here we go. Let me see if I can get us to the right place here. Um, okay. Let me just get us to the right place. And we'll continue. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. All right, this is where we were. Um, so, um, 
Uh, the purpose for this, uh, the neuropsychological evaluation is to inform diagnosis, define strengths and weaknesses, uh, suggest best treatment options, track rec uh, recovery over time. Um, and the process here is use of pen, uh, paper and pencil and computerized testing, testing to measure uh, cognitive abilities. This is usually an in-person evaluation. So for our more severe patients, uh, we refer them to the Brain Injury Research Center. Now, as far as short-term cognitive rehabilitation, cognitive rehabilitation, supportive psychotherapy, um, and empirically supported interventions such as sleep, fatigue, pain management, anxiety, and mood are incorporated in the evaluation here. Um, we, uh, interestingly enough, we provide guided relearning of cognitive skills and developing strategies to compensate for loss or weakened cognitive function. So uh, overall, um, this program is robust and complete and uh, not only do we help those with concussion, but post-stroke, post-brain injury, uh, post-surgery, um, anything that causes any cognitive issues, uh, the Brain Injury Research Center is the place to go. Now, NeuronUp <coughs> excuse me, is another platform that we're using. Now, this is different from the uh, Brain Injury Research Center in that it's a web-based platform. It's designed to act as a key support for occupational therapists and other professionals involved in cognitive rehabilitation and stimulation processes. It consists of a number of uh, materials and resources for designing treatment sessions in addition to a uh, patient manager for organizing and saving the results of those sessions. So uh, Neuron Up is a web-based program that can be done anywhere. So uh, for our patients who are homebound or are afraid to come to the hospital, We've now transitioned to Neuron Up um, as a way to give them cognitive rehabilitation. Um, the great piece about Neuron Up, to, uh, though, is that it's customizable. You do have a dashboard that you can see whether or not a patient is doing well in certain domains and adjust what they need to, uh, to be doing for, uh, moving forward. So we're really happy with Neuron Up as far as another option for neuro rehabilitation. SANA, okay. So SANA Health, um, back in 2017, uh, we held the, um, uh, the hackathon uh, here at Mount Sinai. Um, and uh, SANA Health actually won the hackathon here um, for their innovative product that we see here that helps those with pain, sleep, and anxiety, sleep disturbance and anxiety by using these goggles, okay, uh, that have both auditory and visual stimulus Okay, and also checks heart rate variability. Um, <clears throat> and what we see here um, is that uh, by wearing these goggles and using this for any of the sleep disturbance issues that our patients have, especially uh, with those that have post-concussion syndrome, has been uh, absolutely useful. And another tool, again, one of the tools that we're using, uh, some of the innovation that we're using to help those that are, are concussed. All right. So as far as our concussion uh, network is, uh, concussion recovery network is concerned, uh, as I mentioned, access has been an issue, you know. Now we have, uh, we've established a pipeline uh, from the emergency department and we guarantee that a patient will be seen within 48 to 72 hours of injury, okay, of referral. Uh, we've created uh, this concussion, hot, concussion care hotline, con concussion at mountsinai.org. So if there's anybody that needs uh, any help, that's manned 24 seven and uh, just send us an email and we'll get them in right away. Um, and already uh, from the schools that we're covering, uh, we've had a number of, of concussions coming in daily. All right, so let's talk about next steps. So as far as our play safety uh, plan, um, we are uh, continuing to expand out to other schools. Uh, Dr. Cancel, um, who is our new recruit, he's our pediatric uh, physiatrist um, and also involved in the New York State Athletic Commission. We are in discussions now to create a combat sports uh, clinic uh, that focuses not only um, on concussion, but other uh, issues related to that. And uh, pre-pandemic, we were in the process of uh, creating a remote 
concussion evaluation program for the Red Bull Academies that, that's located in Austria. Um, that has uh, restarted up again. Um, this is for their hockey players as well as their um, uh, soccer players and basketball players that uh, play in, in Europe. So we're developing that program as we speak. As far as the TBI research is concerned, um, our rehabilitation uh, neuropsychology faculty at the Burke is very much involved in um, the latest and greatest. Uh, some of the current projects include the late effects of TBI, the brain donor program. Uh, this is uh, the program where um, a number of the um, uh, former NFL players have donated their brain to. Uh, ultra high field imaging of post TBI epilepsy. Uh, physiological mechanisms of executive attention recovery, bridging transitions from post-acute care, clinical trials, TBI and health, uh, and health in adults. We have a number of focus groups, everything from uh, groups that help the patient and also those who are caring for the patient. Um, and we have a randomized controlled trial on online emotional regu regulation training as well. And as I mentioned, uh, we recently got funded uh, for continued uh, studies on NeuroCheck. Again, look out for this. I think that this may be our uh, objective measure. Again, it's only one piece of the puzzle. I hope that, that we can find something more behind that. Um, this is a whole topic and lecture on its own, um, but uh, this I'm very excited about. And the other thing that we're doing is uh, we're partnering with Thorn on uh, Nutraceuticals. Uh, Thorn is a very well recognized um, uh, company that's provided um, nutraceuticals for the Olympics and uh, a lot of the professional sports due to their process of making sure that there are no other ingredients uh, that may alter an athlete's ability to compete um, uh, in the vitamins and minerals and uh, supplements that they provide. Um, the, uh, the product that we're looking at is ben benthothiamine. Uh, which has shown some benefit in Alzheimer's. Uh, we don't know uh, its effect on concussion yet, but that's something else that's currently being funded as we speak. So hopefully um, you were able to gain an understanding of our current concussion program and how we are now using technologies to improve our concussion management. Um, I still think that there are a lot of other next steps besides the ones that I've outlined, including hyperbaric chambers um, and uh, uh, looking for that uh, elusive biomarker. I think we're getting close. Um, so I want to send a special thank you to our team, Dr. Uh, Petrino, Kristen Dams O'Connor, Jenna Tosto, uh, our doctors, Miriam Zachary, Chang Cancel, Adam Fry, Amy Kim. Our fellows, Jasmine Harunian, uh, Michelle Leung, uh, Chris Hoglet, Daniel Spunberg, and our therapist, Chris Lewis, Tracy Lynn, and Erica Brayman and Layla Nasser for making sure that our patients get cared for. And also, uh, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Mount Sinai Rehab. Uh, at, at, we are at, at Mount Sinai Rehab. All right, any questions? Dr. Herrera, that was really spectacular and very worthy of the 20th post lecture. I'm sure that Chris Ragnarsson would be amazed and proud to see where your department has come. Um, are, are there any faculty or attendees who have comments or questions? Yes, I would love to make a comment. Uh, this is Dr. Chowdhury. I'm sorry, I don't have my camera on. I'm still in, stuck in traffic, but uh, I enjoyed your lecture tremendously. And as you know, many of us in our neurosurgery department are interested in this topic. I appreciate the shout out for me, but you know, Zach Hickman and the whole Neuro, New York Neurotrauma Consortium, which you guys are very much in, lead, in the lead position for, and um, even uh, Dr. Morgenstern and other pediatrics, I guess, you know, I think your approach overall has a lot that we can learn from in terms of looking at multiple technologies and applying them in smaller areas first, like fields done at school. I think there's so much we can learn from. Um, I think I agree with your general principle that we need more objective uh, tools, even though I do a lot of research with impact, each one of these tools has some limitations. And I think uh, there's a lot of areas of overlap. We're doing some work in collaboration with hyperbarics and others. And I guess my question for you is, first of all, congratulations on the presentation and the work. But my question for you is, uh, 
COVID has brought up an interesting uh, set of issues, both with the disease itself, as well as per perhaps even the vaccine in terms of inflammation and neuroinflammation, as you know, is an issue of importance in brain injury. And uh, so I guess my question to you is, are you doing any specific research in this area? And if so, I would love to collaborate. So yes, uh, we are doing some research around um, uh, around COVID, uh, looking at brain check. Um, actually, I'm, I'll, I'll be presenting to the CDC uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, at 2 p.m. So if anybody would like to tune in, I'll be, I'll be presenting on uh, the program that we've developed here that uh, uh, is now going national. Um, that is the graded uh, return to activity uh, uh, physical therapy program. Uh, that Jenna Tosto and our therapists have been diligent about uh, helping uh, those with post-COVID or the long haul syndrome. syndrome. Um, you know, the initial numbers right now and uh, is that uh, those who enter our program uh, for both uh, fatigue and brain fog, um, we are implementing a, um, a breathwork program first, right? That's through our um, partner, uh, Stasis. They are a, a set of uh, Navy SEALs that teach uh, those how to do breath work. Um, we implemented that for our post-COVID program and then a specific return to activity program for um, our post-COVID patients. Um, so it, I'll, I'll share some of the initial findings right now, but what we're seeing is that those who entered the program uh, as compared to those who have not entered the program are recovering 40% faster, okay, when they are in our program. So we've been fortunate enough uh, with working with a uh, post-COVID clinic that um, uh, we, we have a long wait list to get into our therapy programs um, and into our rehabilitation program in general. Um, and so we have those metrics and these patients are being given these um, surveys uh, consistently and uh, we're seeing a plateau uh, for those who don't make it into the program and those who are getting better. Um, so um, yes, the answer is yes, we're looking at this. We're even uh, looking at different diets, as you can imagine, the uh, non-inflammatory diet uh, through our nutritionist uh, uh, has been a hot topic, um, the, the, the low histamine diets as well. So uh, there is, I think uh, COVID has been a, um, a source of a lot of uh, research opportunities um, and a way to find uh, help for, uh, for patients. I mean, we're so early in the disease process as we speak right now. So, um, so yes, the answer, you. if you're interested, we, we definitely can use more hands on deck. Uh, because <laughs> I know our, our, our staff and our researchers are very stretched between their own projects and now COVID on top of that. So. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank I think COVID much. Let's, uh, let's move on from COVID. Joe, can you, would you be kind enough to stop sharing your screen so that we can, uh, so I have a question for you. First, uh, thank you so much for sharing this breathtaking uh, lecture um, and experience with us. This is really a masterpiece. We have a lot of residents uh, today. And uh, one of the topics that we uh, reviewed recently was uh, the concept that apps uh, tend to be a little bit easier to introduce in our field. And you eloquently said that COVID actually showed that technology uh, comes in uh, faster, especially when we need it. So I would like if you could spend just a couple of minutes going from the idea of an app and to the implementation of it. You've shown it in your lecture, but I just wanted to get a few more hands on deck, like you said, uh, so that the residents can have a better sense of how can that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, that's a, thank you for the question. And the implementation or uh, adoption of technology has been challenging for medicine in general, right? Um, uh, when you look at, um, the ideas around health technology and the disconnect between what's made, what's funded. You know, you have all of these um, uh, venture capitalists that say, oh, this is the next great idea. Uh, they go to, their, uh, to the, um, the, the engineers, software engineers, to the, um, uh, to the other engineers, and sometimes a clinician who's somewhat involved, but not really. So, I think the best way and the best uh, way to, to develop an app is in-house, 
look at your own practices, see what the deficits are, see what the need is, and then work backwards. More often than not, there is this big, what they call the valley of death of, of technology. And from the um, first uh, uh, capital funding for apps, products, et cetera, and getting it over that valley of death so that it's clinically integrated, that's why we, I built the Abilities Research Center and, and recruited Dr. Petrino and all these other people in order to get over that valley of death, right? So I think the best source for apps and technology is going to come from us, right? It's the doctors, the physicians, those who are in the trenches who see the problems and say, this is the solution. Um, now, um, in the Abilities Research Center, uh, we do have some brainstorming sessions. I know that Dr. Kellner is very much a part of that. Um, and uh, uh, we invite everybody here who has an issue to come and share with us what those issues are. And we can brainstorm and see what, you know, what works, what doesn't work, right? Because not all technology is perfect. So, um, and that's why right now we're, we're, we're field testing this. One piece that I knew needed to be uh, solid was the timing, you know? That's why I pointed that out uh, with the use of the apps. Because if, if it took forever to upload every single person into those apps, it would be no good, right? Especially when we're screening and we're doing all these athletes uh, marching through, forget it. You know, so uh, that was one of the criteria we had as far as building the app. So what is the need? You know, work with an engineer, um, you know, and make sure it's on multiple platforms, not just one. OK, so that's a big mistake. You know, it's only on the iPhone or it's a it's an Android app. Right. Um, and then uh, do your pilot study as see if it's viable and then move forward. Uh, the problem to today with medicine is that randomized control trials, unfortunately, take forever. Right. So the adopt by the time you're done five years, 10 years down the road, the app is off is obsolete. So clinical trials, I think, is the way to go. Right. So uh, doing rapid adoption uh, maneuvers, getting it through the FDA. So we helped uh, APOS therapy do that um, here in the United States. Um, and uh, um, I think the big message here is the a successful app comes from within. Find the problem and move it forward. Yeah, any other any other uh, I had a question for residents? You. Please go uh, ahead. Uh, the, the, hey, Dr. Doctor, doctor, but the um, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, we talk a lot about return to play in kids, um, and it's a huge problem. But I think an even bigger problem is return to school um, because that affects the entire spectrum, non non athletes as well. Have you guys worked at all on that or talked about protocols for return to um, to that kind of activity? Yes, yeah. So the, it's the return to learn activities, right? And so the return to learn protocol, it's similar to that guided exertion um, uh, uh, protocol that we have for athletics, uh, very similar. And we follow that for cognitive um, uh, stressors, you know, which is school, screen time, um, etc. cetera. Um, now, uh, one piece that has not yet been um, uh, quantified is screen time, right? So. Uh, when a patient sits, when a when you have a child or a patient that's constantly on their smartphone or in front of a computer, um, should you eliminate it completely? Not necessarily, right? So we use the same principles as the Buffalo treadmill protocol. Try to find where their upper limit is, and that's something that we share with our parents. What's the upper limit of of cognitive uh, performance? Is it half an hour? Is it pen and paper? Is it sitting in front of a a computer? Okay. Um, so, uh, we use those different metrics to, uh, help guide return to learn. Alexander. Hey, Dr. Herrera. I'm Alex. I'm one of the third year residents here in our program. Um, I also work in Dr. Chowdhury's lab, uh, and have done a lot of, uh, work on impact and as a former college athlete as well, I can tell, you know, there are obviously some limitations with someone who used to take impact all the time. Um, you mentioned the subjectability. But I think one of, the, one of the merits of impact, as you know, is just the accessibility and the relative affordability of the test. And I think I've thought a lot about over the past couple of years of what is the best field size concussion test that we can really administer. And, and from what I've gathered, there are two real limitations, right? One is the cost and one is the resources needed. It'd be awesome if we could really do a great biomarker study looking at serum and CSF of all of our athletes. But as you know, and as you saw firsthand, it's not really so viable. So 
I'm curious now that you guys have really delved into all these different technologies and these new startups, what have you gathered as far as what the best, maybe in terms of broad scale, what do you think the best direction is in terms of on-field testing and field side return to play guidelines and how we can best administer this? Because obviously we can't offer this $10,000 uh, eyepiece to Hodunk High School in, in a rural town, right? They're never going to be able to afford something like this. So what do we think is the best um, kind of method in terms of wide-scale accessibility to assessing concussion or young athletes? That's a great question. So, um, you know, the um, uh, that's why uh, one of the piece besides the neurocheck, you know, that that can be done sideline, right? Uh, but that's a piece of equipment that we don't even know what the price point is yet for that, right? Hopefully, it's going to be affordable. Interestingly enough, the initial study uh, for that used Google Cardboard, okay, uh, with an iPhone in it, uh, with the with the transmission of that. Um, signal that stimulus at 15 hertz and then these eeg signals so um it's doable and then they developed that whole nice uh, vr set right so um i you know actually dr patrina and i always talk about like affordability and making sure that this is accessible um we you know we're talking about maybe doing a google cardboard version of that you know um making that accessible for our lazarus children right um now, the other piece here, too, objective measures uh, for concussion, uh, um, uh, that's why we're piloting the Tway app, you know, looking at physical uh, measures as well, okay? It's, it's objective, um, uh, could be subjective if the patient wants to continue to play, but I, usually they want to get back out on the field as opposed to uh, prolonging injury, <coughs> excuse me. But I think that there are a number of uh, different avenues that can still go down. You know, that eye tracking still is out there, you know, uh, all of that work, uh, along with this uh, signal that we're starting to see, um, you know, as far as objective measures, you know. Uh, so uh, that app, um, we are going to make that free and available uh, for schools in general. We have this whole uh, concussion kit that we're going to be giving all the schools that sign up with our Lazarus Center um, that includes that. You know, so um, I think well, we're going to find a way to find objective measures uh, to measure concussion on the sideline. I hope, you know, those are just, again, all small pieces that uh, lead to the bigger picture. Kurt? Hey, thank you so much. Kurt, do you have any questions or comments? Chris Kellner? Kurt? I, I, yeah, I guess I had a quick question um, or something I was thinking about. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, correlation in my mind between concussion and um, proceeding through neurosurgical residency and uh, just your, th your, your comments on doing a baseline testing at the beginning of residency and see how that kind of progresses um, throughout residency to see how, um, how things change neuropsych neuropsychologically. I think it would be something I, I was uh, interested in, in kind of thinking about uh, the potential future research. And we've been working with as you know, Dan Turner, Chris Kellner, um, and Dr. Petrino on our own performance enhancement um, program. And I think that's part of that, I think. Um, but I, I think taking a step further and looking at the intern versus chief level to see how it changes over time, I think would be you know, very interesting. So again, thank you for your uh, talk and uh, comments. Yeah, no, I think that's super interesting. And uh, that, that delves into our Performance 360 program, looking at how we can improve performance for our our own doctors, right? How do we recover? How do we how do we change? You know, what is the what is our makeup moving forward as uh, you go from a first year uh, as an intern all the way to a full fledged attending, right? So um, that definitely interests me, and I know that we're we're actively working on that as we speak. And I just want to say thank you so much for developing this system uh, for assessing performance because it really is applicable to a lot of different disease processes. For me, stroke for Dr. Chowdhury for spine recovery. Um, and, you know, it, it really becomes a system that you can apply to really any, any member of our department could make use of it. Uh, thank you for that. You know, we're very proud of it. Well, that was wonderful. Are there any other comments or questions? Joe, is it, did I understand you say that you can reverse visual evoke potentials using Ativan? 
Then the athletes trick the trick they trick the machine. You know, so um, with those with the goggles, uh, not not visually evoked potentials. This is the eye tracking. Eye tracking. Eye tracking. So um, uh, <laughs> we heard from one of our uh, NFL athletes that one way they trick the goggles is by taking um, Ambien. Ambien. Um, when they do the uh, eye tracking, <laughs> it's uh, a little bit wobbly. And so if they do get concussed and do it again, you know, it's, <laughs> there's no difference. I mean, I don't know if it's true. Uh, it's just hearsay, but it's, uh, it's what's out there for those you athletes mean, who- You mean they it. take the Ambien to yes. induce wobbliness so, exactly. there's no, so there's no delta from right after when they were hit? That's right, that's correct. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. You threw that in there. I wasn't sure I understood it. Are there any other comments or questions on this wonderful post lecture? Zach Hickman here. I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Herrera. That was an excellent talk. And, you know, I think access, access to all this great technology and is often, you know, one of the issues we have and the resources over at Elmhurst, obviously. And I think leveraging technology to kind of offload the need for some of those the manpower sometimes is it's going to be kind of key going forward too so thank you uh, thank you and i agree 100 percent. there's a there's a good question in the qa here uh, from an attendee you know what though i think we're gonna it's at 902 we people who want to stay certainly should um i wanted to thank the selection committee and dr herrera um for this and i'm sure joe would be willing to stay for uh further question and answers. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all. And there was one there was one question here that I think is relevant, especially it's, you know, in the high level athletes organizations where performance is directly related to profit and revenue, have you seen pushback in implementing the data you're finding? And if so, how have you uh, attempted to manage these obstacles? So that is true. So we, I mean, um, uh, having dealt with a lot of the uh, professional teams, um, uh, the kings are the uh, the agents and the trainers and the coaches and the owners. Um, sometimes they make decisions that are not at the uh, best interest of the athlete. Um, we are for fortunately or unfortunately, um, we are not yet there as far as implementing some of the technology that we're developing. Um, we did get some interest, uh, especially with NeuroCheck, uh, with uh, the NFL. Uh, although I think it's still pretty early on, so we just are not there yet for, uh, to, to see if they will adopt it or not. Um, I know that with the uh, goggles, the other goggles, the eye tracking goggles, uh, I think the majority of the athletes ended up showing that they had some concussion. So uh, it was not uh, adopted wholly by the NFL. Some teams do uh, implement it, but not all. And then one other question here um, was, you know, that there are some links now, as we see in the aging population, between concussion earlier in life and increases in dementia and other neurodegenerative disorders later in life. Um, do you know of any sort of long-term studies, either here at Sinai or elsewhere, that are looking into interventions that can help reverse the effects of concussions early in life? So that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, trying to reverse concussion. And so um, through our Brain Injury Research Center, there is that longitudinal study that's looking at um, uh, late effects of uh, TBI. Um, I think that's the closest we're getting to that. Uh, but overall, I, I <coughs> uh, as far as other studies, um, not yet, not yet, but definitely interested. We have uh, other questions. Other questions? I see, see one hand up. I'm just trying to give him a chance to. Hi, this is Mel Proskoff in, in New Hampshire. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Herrera. We've got all our little local high schools here in uh, New Hampshire and uh, in rural areas where uh, obviously it's hard to get all the, the finances that you have in New York, but it's, it's wonderful and it's a lot that I can take back to the local organizations. Is there a linkage between 
Sinai Biodesign and your Abilities Research Center in terms of developing the new technology? So is it basically software or are you doing hardware stuff too? Uh, so we're both, and, and there is a link. Um, we do work with Sinai Biodesign, uh, uh, Dr. Pacino does. So yes, um, there is a link there, but we are, we are a separate um, division within the department here. Um, you know, we work uh, collaboratively with them, MSIP, um, et cetera. So uh, it's both hardware and software um, that we look at. So uh, we look at different technologies uh, uh, that vary in maturity, some that are conceptual all the way to those that are very mature um, to see if, they're, if they uh, will stand the test of clinical trials. Uh, so overall, um, you know, we're really happy with what we see. And this is just one of the products that we've seen. I didn't even tell you about all the other, the 10, 20 other products that were concussion related that we just did not go with at all. You know, it just was A, too expensive or B, too cumbersome to, to implement in the field. Okay, that's very good. And having come along with having uh, trained with neuropsychology uh, going back a hundred years, uh, it's tremendous seeing the metrics applied to neuropsychology. So it's much more of a science than it previously had been. Yes, no, and, and I have to give uh, Kristen Dams O'Connor and her group there a lot of credit. And that's the reason why she's currently ranked sixth in, sixth in the country um, for uh, applying metrics and looking at ways to uh, really measure outcomes for, their, for our patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Chris and...